Good evening, everybody, and truly, truly thank you for all being here tonight, because the topic that's going to be presented, the Vietnam War and how it all began, is not a topic that's really understood by many, in particular now, the youth coming up to our, our various schools. And what I'd like to do is not talk about the war itself, because that's a separate presentation, but this is a presentation about how it all began, and more importantly, why did it begin? So with this all being the case, yes, we'll begin with its, the explanation of the Vietnam War on how it all began. As far as the area known as Southeast Asia, within Southeast Asia, prior to World War I and right thereafter, it's the French that dominated the region. And that region was known as French Indochina. Would like to bring up a map which notes what the French had influence over. In essence, their sphere of influence and control included all the darker green areas, which are noted as Laos, Vietnam, and Cambodia. Very, very large area, and it's an area the French dominated for one good reason. They truly pulled from that region for their benefit all the oil and the rubber and the rice that they could, again, for the benefit of their country. So in essence, in the World War I era, this whole area was known as French Indochina and not the independent nations that are so noted. They become independent well after the Vietnam War. But right now, we're only talking about a period of time right after World War I. And after World War I, the Vietnamese set out to seek independence from France for their own well-being, so they could establish their own nation and benefit the people that live within by their own efforts and not have their efforts controlled by others, such as in this case, France. So the Vietnamese nationals come to the fore and they're led by a leader by the name of Ho Chi Minh. And what he does after World War I is he uh, petitions our president, President Woodrow Wilson, when at Versailles, and negotiating the Versailles Peace Treaty. And this was in 1919. He asked of President Woodrow Wilson, would he support their cause for independence within Southeast Asia? Wilson at this particular time was supporting the independence of nations throughout Europe, in particular, Eastern Europe, such as Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and Romania. They all come to the fore because of Woodrow Wilson and his push for their independence. But when Ho Chi Minh asked for such support for the Vietnamese in Southeast Asia, what did he do? And that's a picture of Ho Chi Minh. Wilson refuses to support the appeal, fearing that it would upset America's ally during World War I and thereafter, and that was France. He turns Ho Chi Minh away. Who does Ho Chi Minh thereafter seek assistance from? Well, from one who was willing to support his goal for independence, and that was the Russian communist leader, Nikolai Lenin who does again agree to support the movement. I want to point out to you, and this is what is thoroughly misunderstood by people throughout the world until the end of the Vietnam War, and that is Ho Chi Minh. He was a nationalist who believes in nationalism more than communism, but he turns to the communist leadership because they're the ones willing to support his drive for independence from France. 
So under Ho Chi Minh, what you have is the formation of Indo-Chinese Communist Party that is set up in 1930. And what the party does is organize a guerrilla army known as the Viet Minh. Why set up such an army? Well, basically, they felt that they had to engage the French in that region to push them out so that they could gain their independence. And that's the flag of the Viet Minh. The Viet Minh, they conducted a regular war against the French, seeking independence from 1930 to 1941, an 11 year war. And the Viet Minh, during this period of time, they also fight another nation that comes in with its military and occupies the region between 1942 and 1945. And that country that comes in and takes over, having kicked the French out, it is Imperial Japanese military. They come in. And the Viet Minh now, as opposed to fighting the French, now begin fighting the Japanese military. And look who supports the Viet Minh in their effort. We do. The United States of America, the president authorizes our Office of Strategic Services to support the Viet Minh in their effort to combat the Japanese in Vietnam. And the Viet Minh, they declared a liberation army under the leadership of an individual that was well experienced in guerrilla warfare. And his leadership does come to the fore, and that's Vo Nien Giat. And this is in 1944. Key point at the very end is look who supports his effort to combat the Japanese and thereafter. And thereafter. He sets forth a vision for Indochina. After the war, he felt the area should become a UN trusteeship. And this would then thereafter lead to the eventual independence of all the countries within that region. Independence from whom? France. Now that Japan had been defeated because of, the, of World War II, the French now started to come back into the region. And who, in essence, opposed to this? It was our president, Franklin Roosevelt. His vision, it becomes the expectation of Ho Chi Minh and his followers. Therefore, what evolves? FDR dies in 1945. That's an unfortunate occurrence because what happens within the region is it comes then therefore on the influence of the president that succeeds FDR, and that's President Harry Truman. Truman did not believe in Ho's effort. He believed Ho's effort was an effort of the Communist Party worldwide. He fears Ho Chi Minh and his drive for independence because he truly believes Ho is a communist. And I pointed out right from the very beginning, Ho truly is a nationalist, but accepts communist support because it's that organization that was supporting his effort to achieve independence in Southeast Asia. So with that being the case, Truman refuses to meet with Ho Chi Minh regarding Vietnamese independence. And what he does, meaning President Truman, he supports France's return to Southeast Asia after World War II. What comes about is that war had pointed out to you before, the French Indochina War, 1946 to 1954. What was this war all about? Well, here's a picture of the French troops that were involved in this conflict. Principally, the contact was, or the conflict was not a regular war, but an irregular war. That's important to understand the conflict as it evolved not during this period of time, but also throughout the Vietnam War that we fought over there after the French had been defeated. 
And it was not, as was pointed out, a regular war. It was an irregular war. There are the troops of the French military that are involved in that war. French Indochina War, 1946 to 1954. What's the nature of the French Indochina War? Well, that's pointed out. The French tried to fight the Viet Minh, which is the army of Ho Chi Minh, as a regular army. And what France does is it positions its military in the major cities that they established there and the forts. Most of the forts located along the major highways that were there to protect those highways and the shipment of supplies and foodstuffs between one town and another town, from one port to another port. Principal fort was known as Dien Bien Phu. And Dien Bien Phu, in the spring of 1954, what Ho Chi Minh decides to do is besiege that fort and cause the French to surrender. And so seizing that fort, then they're about it, tear apart the supply, the supply route that the French were utilizing to supply their, their people, their, their supporters in Vietnam. U.S. air support is requested by the French to, in essence, uh, counter the Vietnam around the Nguyen Bien Phu. At this particular time, look who's president. And the person who's president is President Eisenhower. He refuses to supply any U.S. air support because he too, like FDR, thought that this would upset their ally, our ally, France. So as a consequence, air support is refused. What comes about in May of 1954, Fort Dien Bien Phu surrenders to the Viet Minh a major, major victory for this army. And here are pictures of the French troops being escorted out of Fort Bien Den Bien Phu. And here's where the Viet Minh are raising their victory flag over the walls of that fort. What comes about is France realized that it could not win a military effort within Indochina, in particular Vietnam. What France agrees to do is accept a peace agreement. And it leads to what's known as the Geneva Peace Accords. And these accords are negotiated in the summer of 1954. As far as the peace accords are concerned, in the summer of 1954, here's a picture of where they were conducted Vietnam is temporarily divided at the 17th parallel pending unification elections. Now, why this decision? Because the French agreed to provide Viet the Viet Minh control over North Vietnam underneath the leadership of Ho Chi Minh. But what the French wanted to do was retain an influence in the area. So what they did was establish a government in South Vietnam under a leader that was supporting the French effort to do so. So therefore, Vietnam becomes temporarily divided at the 70th parallel. The communists take control of North Vietnam, and the non-communists, as viewed by the world, take control of South Vietnam. And it was agreed at this accord session, no more foreign troops would be permitted in Vietnam. French had to withdraw, and anyone supporting the French had to withdraw, to include us. No foreign troops permitted in Vietnam. And a reunification vote was to take place in 1956 between those living in the North and those living in the South. They were agreed to a common government that would govern the entire area of Vietnam. And the accords are signed in July of 1954. After the accords are signed, take a look at this. Vietnam is divided at the 17th parallel, and two other nations come into the fore. 
One is Laos and one is Cambodia. They're formed as nations, and you saw them on the, those two nations on the map before. Here to four, they were totally under the control of the French. And here's the picture of this area that I'm speaking about. North Vietnam, along the Gulf of Tonkin, and South Vietnam, same. And then off to the left, now the new nation known as Cambodia, the new nation known as Laos. Post declared president of North Vietnam, and Bao Dai, the individual that the Japanese relied upon to lead a Japanese-aligned government during World War II within North Vietnam, Hanoi in particular, is Bao Dai that's a, declared the leader of South Vietnam. And he does swear to accept the leadership and accept the guidance of the free countries in the area. In fear of communism, that was arising in the North because they viewed Ho Chi Minh as a communist. Keep in mind, Ho Chi Minh was more a nationalist than a communist. But this causes major migration of landowners, businessmen, anti-communists, and Catholics who live in the northern part of Vietnam to move south. And anyone that believed in Ho Chi Minh and his goal, but they, since they were living in South Vietnam, they decide to move north into North Vietnam, once again, accepting leadership of Ho Chi Minh. And therefore, in 1956, a political crisis erupts. Why? Because national elections in the South are refused. Ho Chi Minh does connect, does conduct national elections in the North part of Vietnam, but Bao Dai refuses because he knew, he knew it could very well be that Ho Chi Minh would win this election and Vietnam would become not just North Vietnam and South Vietnam, but the nation of Vietnam. Bao Dai refuses to conduct national elections in the South. Ho remains present, therefore, on North Vietnam only. And a picture now of Ho Chi Minh. As far as the local elections held in the South, an individual named Ngo Dinh Dien is elected president of South Vietnam. He was a politician, major politician, influential throughout the southern part of South Vietnam. And Bao Dai agreed to accept his election as the president now of South Vietnam. And there's a picture in the Godin Dien. Who do we back after the election that takes place in 1956? Well, once again, because of the Cold War, fearing communist movement all throughout the world, we back Diem because we do, do believe at this time Ho Chi Minh is a communist. So the U.S. backs Diem to further contain communism. Now, as far as Ngo Dinh Diem, who was this individual? Well, he's one who was educated in America and becomes a Catholic, so he's accepted by the French Indo-Chinese society when France occupied that region known as French Indochina. Where was he educated? Right here in the state of New Jersey. He attended Georgian Court University and graduated with a BA degree. Georgian Court University is the one who, in essence, was the one who trained and educated Ngo Dinh Diem. As President of South Vietnam, he uses the military that we provide to maintain a large military and also secret police headed by his brother Nu. And the administration, unfortunately, is marked by a great deal of corruption. It, however, is accepted at this moment. What does he use his military for? To suppress dissidents and political opponents instead of fighting the evolving communist guerrilla force within South Vietnam, now known as the Viet Cong. He starts to suppress the dissidents, in particular the Buddhists. Uh, the Buddhist, and 
the non-Catholics and the peasantry throughout the region who believe more so in Ho Chi Minh and his effort to better their lives, not so much to go to Indian. So as a consequence, what comes to the fore within this peasantry, within the Catholic religious groups, is a communist guerrilla force known as the Viet Cong. Diem's actions also alienate his generals. So now moving on. What becomes the basis for the war in Vietnam as we understood it throughout the 50s and the 60s? Well, it was the repression by Ngo Dinh Diem, the leader of South Vietnam. And that repression causes the formation of the National Liberation Front. And in particular, they were supported, this front was supported by the Buddhist communities and the peasantry throughout the region. They support the National Liberation Front military arm, the Viet Cong. And here's a picture of the flag of the Viet Cong. In 1960, during this period of repression by the Diem regime throughout South Vietnam, North Vietnam comes to the aid of the National Liberation Front. I want to point out to you, prior to this point, all that was evolving in South Vietnam was evolving independent, independent of the North Vietnamese government, independent of the North Vietnamese military. But in 1960, as Diem begins to repress those that were, in essence, moving to one way or another, enter or move Diem from control. North Vietnam comes to the aid of the National Liberation Front. It's in 1960 that this evolves. And they supply the National Liberation Front via what's known as the Ho Chi Minh Trail, running through now Cambodia and through Laos. Not that Cambodia and Laos supported this effort, but they did enable the Vietnamese military to shift supplies down to the National Liberation Front in South Vietnam. National Liberation Front goal, the liberation of South Vietnam from the Diem regime. It's the regime that was suppressing then and those that were living within the southern region of Vietnam. Who do we support in this effort now? We support Ngo Dinh Diem and his military advisors. We send advisors ourselves to assist Diem's military counter the Viet Cong. The conflict in Vietnam should be understood now as a civil war not a war of communism versus nationalism or liberalism. It's a war that's being fought between those in the North and those in the South that truly believe Vietnam should be a single nation, not divided North and South. And therefore, this conflict becomes a civil war. War fought by the flag of South Vietnam and the war fought by the Viet Cong located within South Vietnam. At this particular moment, the North Vietnamese military were not directly involved in this conflict. And what this map points out to you is where the Ho Chi Minh Trail existed. It existed through Laos and through Cambodia. Neither nation had the wherewithal to prevent the supply of the Viet Cong from North Vietnam, nor did either nation want to in, impose any, any opposition. So as a consequence, these supplies came down that, that path freely. As far as U.S. military assistance, in 1960, 
the Military Assistance Advisor Group, known as MAG, is formed, and it is sent to South Vietnam to assist Diem's military. Now, in 1962, this Military Assistance Command, it replaces what's known as the MAG, as just known before, because of the fighting that now becomes very, very intensified in Vietnam. So we've moved from just providing advisors to now providing a command structure to help the South Vietnamese fight the Viet Cong. In 1962, take a look at now what it becomes. Military Assistance Command is designated a combat command. Now we are more fully committed to South Vietnam than ever before. And in 1963, this is when we experienced the first U.S. advisors being killed. And this was in January of 1963. In June of 1964, because of the seriousness of what was occurring in South Vietnam, in June of that year, General William Westmoreland assumes command of this military command. The U.S. and the Vietnamese conflict, let's take a look at this. The conflict revolves into the longest continuous military engagement against a foreign force, 1956 to 1973. Does it, in essence, lead to a successful war effort? No, it does not. And I think you're beginning to understand why it does not. More will be explained in a, another, another program when I focus in on the Vietnam War itself. What I'm focusing in on right now is what happened to bring about this war, which hopefully you understand truly was more of a war, a civil war, than it was of a war between communism and, and, and democracy. This truly was not a war of such. And indeed, take a look at all the number of American units that were assigned to combat the Viet Cong. And as you take a look at that map, you're looking at about seven plus American infantry divisions supported by an Air Force and by a Naval Force to fight the Viet Cong. Again, the Viet Cong, the real force of, of the National Liberation Front in South Vietnam. The involvement is based on the Cold War policy known as the Truman Doctrine. Wherever we feared communists was on the move, we were going to counter them. And prior to 1956, where did we, in essence, effectively counter the communist movement south of a border? Well, it was in Korea. It was in Korea. And what comes about in 1950 through 1953, a three-year war in which over 42,000 men were killed. We did support the South Vietnamese of uh, the South Koreans in fighting the North Koreas. Was that a war between communists and those believing in democracy? Well, yes, it was. But this was not the nature of this conflict. The involvement was also based upon, all right, an American misunderstanding of the conflict, which is what I've been relating for a period of time. This is a conflict, it's a struggle for national unity, not an expansion of communism. In view of the struggle, it was influenced a great deal by the success of another communist movement located within China, under the leadership of Mao Tse-sung. During this period of time, it is the Communist Party that successfully takes over all of China, something that we fear then, and to a certain extent, have a fear to this very day. 
what this war results in? Over 58,000 deaths, many more than what we incurred during the course of the Korean War. In this case here, over 58,000 deaths. So what I'd like to do now is show you this, this clip, which explains in essence via this video what had just been relayed. So let's take a look at this. Emperor Bao Dai was in control okay, of Vietnam go. at this time. He too wanted an independent country, but the only problem was he wanted the economy to be on the Western capitalist lines, while men wanted it to be communist. This started a long struggle for supremacy. The northern half with men and the southern with the emperor. The actual involvement of America in the war started in 1954, though the struggle had started decades ago. In May 1954, in the Battle of Tien Bien Phu, the French lost to the Ho Chi Minh's forces, and this ended colonial rule in Indochina. A treaty was signed at the Geneva Conference, dividing Vietnam as North and South along the latitude known as the 17th parallel, giving North to Min and South to Bao. The treaty also called for national-wide elections in 1956 for unification. However, in 1955, the emperor was pushed aside by a strong anti-communist leader and he took control, calling his government the Republic of Vietnam. The Cold War had intensified and USA's policy of making sure communism and Russian supremacy did not spread took massive proportions. President Eisenhower pledged his complete support to South Vietnam. With complete training and equipment from the USA Diem managed to break into the back of Min's supporters and imprisoned them. He also tortured and executed them. The war between these two factions intensified and by 1960, the National Liberation Front was formed to fight against the oppressive regime. The NLF claimed to be autonomous, but most believed it to be a puppet in the hands of Hanoi. All right, now that brings an end to this particular video. And in essence, what you heard from really uh, a segment presented by a Vietnamese organization about what really happened in Vietnam after World War II. I did want you to hear what their viewpoint happened to be. And this is the viewpoint of what I just presented. So with all this being the case, Let's take a look at now, after what you've just seen and heard, and with now knowing that a major war evolved for a good 10 years soon after, soon after the Korean War, and because of the Cold War policy that existed within the United States, we did become thoroughly involved in the longest war we ever fought. How many did we lose within that war? 58,000 plus men. Many you probably either heard about or knew within your family or within your neighborhood. But I do want to point this out also, and that is after the war, what comes about is, well, in essence, Vietnam today. And what nation basically supported the redevelopment of Vietnam after World War II, after the Vietnam War, not just World War II, but also the Vietnam War. What nation basically supported its redevelopment? We did. And what comes about is Vietnam is now a thriving lower middle-class country governed by a non-communist government. 
Its capital is located in the city of Hanoi. And look who the governor of the of North, or actually now Vietnam, partners with in order to further development or develop its economy. It is the United States of America, the an agency that we established to help them, and that is the U.S. Agency for International Development. That's the agency now that is actually to this very day assisting the government of Vietnam help develop further its economy and its, com its communities. In essence, what comes about is a Vietnam originally envisioned by Ho Chi Minh. And that is a picture of Vietnam today, its capital, Hanoi. So that does bring it in now to the presentation. Do not want to go any further regarding the Vietnam War itself, because that is a separate presentation that can be made in the future. But what I really want you to understand up to this particular point is how it all came about and what the true nature of that conflict happened to be. It was not a war between communism and, and nationalism but a war for national unity. It was a civil war. And ultimately what comes about is the war being won by the government of North Vietnam. The elections do take place thereafter, and today the government is a government of one Vietnam, a solidified Vietnam with its capital in Hanoi. 